Hello, my name is Vani Kanda. I'm from Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, and I'm here in Vienna at ISDE 2018, joined by my esteemed panelists. Gary Falk at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Ken Wang, Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Pratik Sharma, Kansas City. Because he has from our Robot University, Nijmegen, the Netherlands. And we're here to talk about endoscopic therapy in Barrett's esophagus. So to start off, who should we treat? Gary. Well, we can start with who we shouldn't treat. I think there's uniform agreement that people with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus are off the table. And I think that people with high-grade dysplasia and intramucosal cancer are the prime targets. Low-grade dysplasia is much more of an individualized situation that is a long discussion in and of itself. But I think that the sweet spot for endoscopic therapy is high-grade dysplasia and intramucosal carcinoma. And when endoscopists start to think about treating for Barrett's esophagus, what tools should, and skills should they have in their hands? Ken? Well, actually, I think anybody who starts should have almost a full set. Because the problem is, even though radiofrequency ablation is clearly what we go to first as an ablative technique once we identify flat dysplasia, you have to be able to handle those with areas of nodularity, those that clearly have something that may be a little more, and then you need to have resective techniques like mucosal resection or submucosal dissection. And finally, you know, they're not totally successful. Occasionally, 10, 20% of the time, we have residual Barrett's esophagus. You're unable to complete the full eradication of intestinal metaplasia. So you need to have alternative strategies, either resection, cryotherapy is uh, something that people are using without a lot of evidence, but you know, you have to try something that are, is available to treat those patients. So once you start, you have to be able, I think, to treat all categories of disease and to follow up in case people uh, don't respond well. And, and I think Ken's absolutely right about like physicians, endoscopists, ability to do everything, right? I mean, if you take it one step further, they should be able to deal with their complications as well, right? I mean, each of these techniques have small yet definite risk of complications. If you get bleeding, if you, you know, have perforation, you should be able to deal with it. So it's not just that you need to be able to apply RFA or APC and that's the only skill set you have. You should be versatile enough right from diagnosis uh, that we just discussed earlier. So if you miss a visible lesion and you start doing ablation, I mean, that's a problem. You may know how to do ablation, but you've missed seeing the lesion, which needed to be resected, and maybe you don't know how to resect. And if you do the resection, and if you get a perforation which needs to be you know, clipped, stented, sutured, whatever, I think you need to have those skills as well. So I think it's the complete package. So Ken's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I, thanks for saying that. You rarely do. <laughs> but, uh, I think <laughs> one of the most uh, important things, though, is if you only have one technique, and we see this a lot because people start doing ablation, that's all they know how to do, and they keep doing it because they don't have that alternative. So oftentimes they'll treat a lesion two, three times, even though they know it looks like it's getting out of hand because they can't take it to the next step. And that's doing the patient a bit of a disservice because you know by the time it gets referred, the lesion becomes more advanced. I don't know if that's an issue in the Netherlands where people get treated multiple times without getting definitive therapy, but you know we're seeing that in the States. Yeah, that's, that's a problem that what I heard also from, from other people from the US. We don't have that problem because we only have eight referral centers where all patients with low grade dysplasia, long segments, and uh, uh, nodularity in, in bad disorders are being treated. Uh, so so we, we get patients referred that have a lesion uh, identified, sometimes biopsy, but sometimes not, which we all prefer, of course. And then we do the treatment uh, according to the guidelines. Uh, so we don't have these patients that have that had already uh, yeah. RFA, and the main reason is that it is too expensive uh, in, in Europe to to start it because it's, well, the reimbursement for these treatments is not perfect. So we have this concept of you know centers of expertise, and you know guidelines say that these patients should be treated in centers of expertise. But at least in the U.S., I don't see that happening. 
No, right? I mean, they, they usually come in, just like Ken said, after mm -hmm. multiple attempts have failed. There's a variety of reasons that they can fail that we can get to in a moment, but I think that uh, you're, you're absolutely right, it's a problem. One thing I would add is that uh, you know, the European data suggests that 90, up, up to 90% of people with high-grade dysplasia are going to have a visible lesion that require EMR. So anybody who is sent to me with high-grade dysplasia, I tell them up front, it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to have RFA this session. You're going to probably have an EMR more than you're going to have RFA if I haven't looked at it before. So I always consent for endoscopic resection. As much as, as RFA has been a game changer, I think endoscopic resection has even been more of a game changer, not the least of which is that it potentially cures uh, early cancer. So I think EMR is, is a huge advance, and you, you, I agree absolutely. You, you can't do EM, uh, RFA without doing EMR. And EMR is definitely our go-to tool in Barrett's esophagus, but what about ESD? What's the role of ESD in Barrett's esophagus? I think there's a limited, but there is a role for ESD in various esophagus, especially for the, for the larger regions and the regions that you expect are uh, are no longer in, into the mucosa or are already growing into the submucosa. For those patients, uh, I think there's a role for for ESD. And I think in your in your case, when patients have already had several treatments, I can imagine that more of, more often than we do, uh, you need to do uh, ESD for these regions that are already there for a long time. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I agree with you. Which was tough too, right? I mean, because ESD is not easy with those fibrosis. No, we, we're, we're running into a lot of fibrosis, and that's a challenge. I, I think for the audience, the most important thing is, is if you're not able to clear the high grade quickly, you know, refer the patient earlier than later because the ESD gets quite challenging with repeated treatments because each treatment leads to some mucosal fibrosis. And that's the most dangerous thing to conditions to work under, not to mention that you might be uh, covering up an invasive cancer. But I think ESD actually in our, in our practice has been growing because of these refractory patients and also that we're taking on more advanced lesions because, you know, now when we have an EUS staged T2 cancer, one that supposedly is invasive, we'll actually reset not just for potential care, but for diagnosis to, to truly establish that these are invasive cancers. A lot of the reasons are the patients who develop cancers with Barrett's esophagus are older, have many more comorbidities, and are not great surgical candidates unless they really need the operation. And we're finding as well as I think the Europeans that a significant portion, third to a half of these patients, can be treated endoscopically with ESD. And we want to do an on-block resection, removal of all the cancers. I think we're not going to get complete R0 resections like the Japanese see with their squamous cells as much because of the issue with dysplasia being at the margins of so much of the Barrett's esophagus. But I think treating the cancers with, uh, with ESD is definitely one of the things that's increasing in right. use. But, but again, the majority of the mucosa of the T1A cancers can be resected or cured by a piecemeal EMR. Uh, and it's the more bulky lesions or the ones with more invasion, which probably need ESD. So I just wanted to make sure that the audience also get, get that it's not that every Barrett's cancer needs ESD. No, I, I think smaller ones definitely can be treated. But this, I'd be a little bit cautious because if you leave a little bit, I mean, people are doing this need to be very expert, right. like yourself. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I had to say that. But, but, you know, if you leave a little bit in a, in a region of scar, that's a very difficult lesion to treat. And we do those, too. I'm sure Peter's had to do those. And, and you know, you want to make sure you get it completely because the piecemeal resection does work when you have good people doing it. You know, it's not like everybody should be jumping on and just because a bander is easy to use does not mean that you completely resect these regions well. Well, that's indeed why you need uh, expert centers. It's, uh, by the way, it's not only, of course, the uh, endoscopist that's supported. It's the whole team of experts <laughs> that's, uh, that's uh, treating the patient. It's the pathologist, the group of pathologists that are experts, that they need to be experts. and. Of course, if you need a uh, resection, then you also need an expert uh, surgeon who's doing this. So, uh, I believe, strongly believe that this is a team effort and not an, uh, something that's being done by experts like us only. 
Oh, absolutely. Every one of our patients with the cancers are seen by surgeons and medical oncologists to get their input as to if something else should be done or if the surgeons feel they're an easy surgical case. You know, certainly we don't want to spend three hours doing an endoscopic procedure when the surgeon can do it much quicker. And in terms of EMR and RFA being the mainstay of most treatment um, for high grade dysplasia and trichosal carcinoma, um, there are other modalities such as cryotherapy and high grade APCs coming out. What are your thoughts about some of these other modalities for ablation? So, go ahead, Gary, you go. Well, I think uh, cryotherapy has some promising data as a salvage technique. There's other data that's being looked at as far as a primary technique. And now with the new device that's balloon-based, I think it remains to be seen how that will compare straight up to RFA. I think that will be looked at in the future. I think a small part in the SURF study that doesn't get the attention it needs is that for little tiny spots of, of Barrett's that remain, APC is a very nice, inexpensive way to go after that. Not large islands, but little tiny areas. APC is, is nice, and that was used in the SURF study to excellent results. And now uh, a new technique being looked at uh, in North America, and I believe Europe as well, is something called endorotor, but that really, that trial is underway right now. Hybrid APC, uh, I think Pratik and Ken can talk more too, as well as Peter. So uh, hybrid APC has had uh, the initial open label study done in Europe, and the results look as good as it with uh, radio frequency ablation. And so the key with all of these techniques will be head-to-head -head trials to see you know, as we talk about POEM and Helen myotomy for achalasia to see which one's better. Uh, you know, again, I mean, you can do these comparisons from different studies, but I think these uh, RCTs will probably give us the answer to if uh, they work as better or better um, than uh, radio frequency ablation. And once we've treated the patient and cleared uh, the dysplasia and the Barrett's, um, what are our thoughts about surveillance after endoscopic therapy? For how long, how often? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we published a, a meta-analysis on recurrence recently. I mean, it, it really looks like recurrence is definitely there and is consistent through time, yeah, at least in our hands and also in the meta-analysis. We were hoping that this would completely drop off after one to two years. But I think all of us have seen these cases where the Barrett's reoccurs and even high-grade dysplasia and cancer. It's not that common, and it would be nice if we had technologies that could tell us which patients are at risk. But I think now we pretty much survey everybody continuously just because... You know, at least in the proposition we've given to the patients, we have an endoscopic cure for your disease. If we can't tell who's going to redevelop it, we have an obligation to follow them to make sure it doesn't reappear. Because these were patients that were potentially curable with a surgical procedure early on, and we've taken the burden on ourselves to offer them this endoscopic solution. So in our minds, we have to follow these patients. Now, the exact interval between checkups is, I think, not established by any means, but I think some form of surveillance needs to be done. Well, thank you. I think that wraps up our session on Barrett's endotherapy.